Hello and welcome to Tales of Tormented Space. Oh, oh, actually, I don't know if this tale is going to be in Tormented Space because I have not read it yet. Very good. Yes. Hi, I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. Um, um, thank you for joining us for another story. Today, it's an official one. Yes. A, a, not just licensed fiction, but like deeply, deeply official fiction. And for a while, this was the last official Farscape like fiction that there was uh, canonical even it is from episode 12 of the farscape magazine <laughs> the last episode of the uh, much beloved farscape magazine once again thank you to metatron for matatron pardon me for sending th that to us we've had tremendous fun with these and yeah this last episode was of course published after the cancellation of the series and the fan fiction there, or the, the, the story there, was... I wouldn't really call it fan fiction, considering that it's anyway. actually written by Rockne S. O'Bannon himself. Exactly, <laughs> and it was intended to be his coda and, like, the official conclusion of the series for the fans who were left hanging with a to-be-continued and a very, very sort of heart-wrenching finale. Yes. So the story's called Horizons and takes place long after the end of season four. And it's quite a long one. So uh, strap yourselves in and enjoy. Let's see. Oh, I'm starting? I thought, no, I thought we were just going to read it in silence together. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. <laughs> to get to the bit where... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Page turning. <laughs> um. Crichton awoke moments after the first sun crested the horizon. He had purposefully never put a covering over the north-facing portal because he liked awakening naturally and the gentle light of the first sun did the job perfectly. One of the countless reasons he had chosen this planet on which to build his home. A planet full of ducks. I think it's just a pair of the Purple Pants People planet. Oh, you think he retired on Aquaria? Now, I was just I was just remarking in case anybody can hear the ducks outside. Oh. It is it is somewhere. <laughs> it is Aquaria. <laughs> We're in Aquaria. I don't have purple pants. I do have a lot of purple shirts. This though. is the dawning of the planet of Aquaria. <laughs> Uh, the structure was no more than five cycles old, built by Crichton himself, with occasional help from the Jashnak labourers he hired to help with the bigger tasks, like transporting wall slabs and shaping the foundation. It was simple in design and function, in the natural colours and style of the American Southwest. Crichton wasn't sure why he decided to build it this way, but it seemed to best fit the rusty clay soil and stark green vegetation of the expansive valley where it resided. The furnishings were as spartan as the six-room dwelling itself. Having been a man on the run for so many cycles, he'd long ago become used to maintaining very few personal possessions. If there was one thing he'd learned living the vast majority of his life at this end of the universe, it was that simple, basic, functional things were always most effective. Mm. His first glimpse of that was his early days out here in what used to be known as the Uncharted Territories. Okay, so it is a tale of the Uncharted Territories. Yay! Those first cycles spent aboard Moya, he dedicated every spare moment to studying the remarkably elegant functionality of the living ship. The thought of Moya gently nudged him back to today's events. You're losing it, John. Mind wandering like that. You're acting like an 80-year-old man, which John Crichton certainly wasn't. He was 311 years old. Holy... Fre 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 uh, holy Frelnick. Yeah, that one. <laughs> As Crichton rose from the bed, he felt the usual stiffness in his joints, elbows, knees especially, and his back always ached for the first hour or so after getting up. But considering he lived nearly four times as long as he would have if he'd never taken that fateful ride into orbit around Earth back in... What Earth year was it? 1999. He wasn't going to complain. The extension of one's natural life was one of the unknown benefits of translator microbes. Ooh! Yeah. Well, unknown to Crichton, at least, in those early days at this end of the universe... It seems translator microbes have long lifespans of their own, and when their host's body begins to age, the microbes go to work, repairing failing systems, fighting off any pesking, debilitating diseases. Crichton's little guys and gals had been performing this function on his behalf for nearly 300 cycles. Oh, he certainly weren't doing that when he was on that other planet, aging along with... Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe they just... Maybe it's just this far, no further. You'll mm. be a crotchety old dude... For another 800 years. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, that could work. That would not be the fountain of youth as most people envision it, but, you know. Well, how would yeah. you envision it? What's... Oh, like, no. if, you were, if you were an alien species looking at, at humanity and say, oh, it's one of those species with senescence. Well, we should, we should, you know, lengthen their optimum span. What's the optimum point? Yeah. Well, certainly not when you're, like, 
uh, osteoporosis is already settling in and right, stuff okay. like that. But yeah. So also, would it, would it, it says it like it, it is a unintended side effect of the translating microbe, so it might not be optimized. So that makes sense. You know, it's like it's a it's a benefit, but not something that you know it's it's planned. It wasn't a planned benefit, so it just does that on humans. Who knows what it does on other species? Oh yeah, good point. Yeah. <clears throat> Crichton moved across the Nibari Teka rug, a gift from a very dear old friend, and gazed out the portal. The valley was brightening. The second sun, the larger of the two was just below the crest of the distant mesas, its rich copper light already splashing across the magnificent unspoiled vistas that sprawled before Crichton's view. Wow. Growing up in North Carolina, Crichton truly loved his family home. As with all adults, well, human adults, he couldn't speak for the myriad other species he'd met over the centuries. But like human adults, Crichton thought such a warm, comforting cocoon of family and home was something only a young child could experience. But here he was, at the other end of his life, and he had that once again. He loved this house he built. For the longest time, he thought he might never have a place to call home again, yet here he stood. There was only one thing missing to make it perfect. One person. As Crichton stared out, the second sun began to appear in earnest, the light very bright, but Crichton didn't look away. He was lost in a reverie, and it was only someone's face he saw before before him. Sorry, it was only someone's face he saw before him. Finally, the sun cleared the mesa completely and Crichton blinked, his reverie broken. And the importance of this particular day returned to him. He had a funeral to attend. Rigel, he said to himself softly. From the last message he received, Moya would be coming for him today. It would be good to see her again, and Pilot, and any of the others they'd managed to contact. He hurried to change, anxious to be ready for the living ship's arrival. Crichton stepped from the transport pod into Moya's transport hangar and immediately felt foolish. Did he really expect everybody aboard to drop everything and be waiting down there to greet him? All several hundred of them? Wow. Crichton hefted his tack bag and headed into the maintenance bay where a group of Ulstrom students clustered around one of the workbenches. A couple of them glanced up as he passed. It took a few moments before recognition dawned and their expressions immediately shifted. They quickly began nudging the others. Soon, all students were staring at him, whispering to each other. Crichton was used to this reaction by now, but he still wasn't comfortable with it. He expected that he never would be. He was now grateful that no one had made his arrival anything special. He gave the students a small acknowledging nod and quickly moved on into the passageway. The passageway was teeming with activity, beings from dozens of different worlds going about their business. It wasn't crowded, really. But Crichton remembered the many years where there were only he and a few others living aboard. Okay, I'm going to have to take a guess. Okay, yeah. Commander Crichton. A tall, lean figure hurried his way, slaloming past the slower beings around him. The figure was a full six inches taller than Crichton. His skin dark brown and creased. The top of his head formed into a protective carpus. Ah. The eyes were large and expressive, and Crichton smiled in instant recognition. Hello, pilot. Crichton said, as the tall figure arrived before him. The figure held out a familiar pincer-like hand. Crichton shook the pincer, grinning widely. I wanted to be in the transport hangar to greet you. That's all right, pilot. Crichton remembered the many, many cycles when pilot wouldn't have been able to meet him in the transport hangar. Ha ha, take that technology. Or here in the passageway, or anywhere. That was before they had discovered the builder's homeworld and spent the better part of a cycle there. During that time, the builders perfected a two-armed, two-legged biomechanoid pilot hybrid into which they were able to transfer Pilot's consciousness. Pilot still had his all-important symbiotic relationship with Moya, still helped maintain her systems, communicated on her behalf, but he no longer needed to be physically connected to her. And just as Moya had served as Pilot's means of leaving his home world and seeing the galaxy, now Pilot could return the favor for Moya, often venturing down onto planets, walking among the civilizations, studying their cultures, experienced them to their fullest, all of which he was able to share symbiotically with Moya. Oh, wow. Imagine if this had actually made it into the show. Yeah. That that they'd made, I mean, much like a Scarron, I guess, you know, which is a, a, a human yeah. performer with... I was kind of more imagining like a, a throne slit like contraption for this, but... Oh, wow, that would be enormous. Mm. Imagine Pilot on, on the command. He'd take up all the space. Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> Moya needed me, Pilot explained. She is experiencing a little dyspepsia. 
I'm afraid her calorics are off because of, you know, word about Rigel. Crichton nodded. Some of the others in the passageway were beginning to look his way and whisper. Pilot noticed and laid a pincer hand on Crichton's shoulder. There was no way to stop word from spreading that you were coming aboard. I understand. Don't sweat it, Pilot. Then Crichton asked, Is there anybody else? Any of the others who... Chan and her husband are aboard. Really? That's great. Pilot leaned closer, lowering his voice. She wasn't here two hours, and she tried to seduce me. <laughs> Crichton tried to suppress the laugh, but it broke into his throat despite his best efforts. I wouldn't worry, Pilot. She's got two husbands already. I doubt she's looking for a third. It's just, you know, her way. But, Commander, she's so, so, so female. Certainly she knows me better than that. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. oh, has Pilot uh, uh. come out of the closet? Are there, are there, <laughs> no, maybe he's like an, an, an asexual or romantic person, or maybe true, he's a gay true. person. Oh. Well, I mean, it, the fact that he uses female like implies that the gender is uh, relevant here. So if it, otherwise he would have said she's so sexual. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah okay. Oh, Crichton nodded, literally having to bite the inside of his cheek to keep from smiling too hard. Poor Pilot looked so worried about this, but then he always looked worried. <laughs> he had from the very first day Crichton met him. And what of Officer Sun? Is she with you, or...? Pilot froze in mid-question as he saw the look on Crichton's face. Crichton! <laughs> A delighted voice suddenly pierced the din of the passageway. Yeah, that sounded really delighted. <laughs> Crichton spun around to see Chiana charging this way. Okay, I do not regret yelling like that because that would have been totally her style. She leapt, taking flight the last 20 feet. Crichton girded himself for impact, but hell, that girl was light as a feather, just as she had always been. She smothered his face in kisses, then slid down to her feet. Oh, damn, isn't that the Earth expression? <laughs> she stood back and looked him over. Frel, me, it's good to see you. How long has it been? A uh, dozen cycles. I'm more like 15, I believe, Commander, Pilot corrected. 15 cycles, and look at you. You look well, Crichton smiled. Not that you look bad or anything, China <laughs> said quickly. I mean, with the white hair, you're starting to look more and more Labari every day. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I hear you're here with your husbands, Crichton said. Mm, I've got Hespi right here. She reached down to the locket around her neck. Crichton was a great admirer of Dr. Hespin. He was a highly intelligent researcher and scientist of considerable renown, and Chiana doted on him. Well, to the degree that Chiana could dote, but theirs was a strong union, based on great love. It didn't matter in the least that Dr. Hespin was microscopic. A small image screen on the frontispiece of the locket flickered, and Hespin's elongated, insect-like face looked up from the work he was engaged in. Of his two mouths, it was the lower that smiled first, followed a moment later by the other. John, how good to see you, <laughs> Hespin spoke from both mouths simultaneously, mm. creating a wonderful, mellifious voice. I only wish it were, were under, under circumstances. <laughs> good choice, dude. Gianna turned the locket so she could speak directly to the image screen. Don't be maudlin, Hespi. You know Rigel chose his time to pass over. We're going to Hyneria to honour his memory, not to mourn him. And I know, Chiana, dear. I keep forgetting that you have a familiar with death that we others do not. Crichton, Chiana, and Pilot all exchanged a look. A knowing look. Like soldiers who have been through a war together and have survived to tell about it. John, I'm hoping we'll have a chance to talk later, <laughs> has been said. I'm engaged in some research that I hear I hope you'll find especially interesting. Ah, I'd like that. Chiana made eye contact with her husband. Are you getting down, settling down inside there? How's your stomach? Still feeling the motion sickness? Well, it's not the same as being in my laboratory. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> well, it's not the same as being in my laboratory at home, my darling, but I'm doing fine, thanks. Pilot stepped forward so Hespin <laughs> could see him. When you're ready to eat something, Doctor, we have quite a delicious selection of nanonutrients. I think I'll give my stomach a little while longer, but thank you, Pilot. Peyton, Crichton said with a squeal. I'd almost forgotten. He's just dying to meet you, John. Beaten? Pilot leaned closer and whispered into Crichton's ear. Husband number two. He's in the centre chamber. He never has a problem eating, Tiana grinned. Well, he's going to keep his strength up. The innuendo was obvious, and Crichton's eyes involuntarily flicked to the locket at Tiana's neck. 
don't worry about Hespi. He knows I have needs. I mean, come on, after all, he is microscopic. The tiniest look passed between Triton and Pilot. <laughs> wow. Speaking of mates, where's Aaron? Triana asked. Crichton's expression shifted, but before he could respond, Pilot stiffened, as if suddenly alert to something. Pilot? What is it? It's it's Moya. She has just detected a a Skellic ship of war bearing directly for us. Instinct kicked in instantly. Without a thought, the three of them took off, running for the command. Attention, Leviathan. Do not attempt starburst. Stand fast and prepare to be boarded. The voice boomed throughout the ship. Mm. Crichton and Shana watched as the heavily armed Skellic ship of war closed on them, filling the command's forward portal. Pilot stood at navigation panel, rapidly working the controls. Pilot, what's their weapon status? Crichton called over his shoulder. Are they charged? Moya isn't detecting any charged weapons, Commander, but the ship's sure as Hesma armed to the teeth. Crichton moved closer to the portal. The ship of war just hung outside, looking every inch as dangerous as Crichton knew it was. The booming voice returned. We expect no resistance. We will board you, and once you have been boarded, you'd best have some Marjors and crispy <laughs> Grolak ready. A repast to honor our fallen comrade. Marjols, Crichton! Marjols. Lovely Hynerian Marjols! Chiana <laughs> stepped up beside Crichton. Their heads turned, their eyes met. And they both said simultaneously, Dargo? Dargo? <laughs> Crichton took three big strides over to Pilot, reached out, and triggered his comms. Dargo? Is that you? That's superior, Dargo, if you don't mind. And then came a resonant laugh that was so very familiar to all of them. <laughs> a dozen Skellic prey warriors... Prey warrior, that's prey a Prey warrior. I, mean, yeah. I guess it's a way, you know, could be another word for hunter, a prey warrior, but meh. Interesting. Fanned out into the passageway, their quarter blades at ready. Once they were in position, Dargo emerged. Crichton stood waiting for him. He couldn't help reacting to Dargo's appearance. His skin, which had always been such a rich brown tone, not true, is much paler in the first season. <laughs> Pay attention. It was now a deep rust color. His tentacles were past his waist in length, pinned in three places to keep them manageable. Tenka has not tentacles. Very good! Thank you! <laughs> he wore a tight vest and a kilt-like wrapping around his loins. Most disconcerting was his left arm, which was now a prosthetic, made of some clear material, the mechanics within visible as they worked. It looked extremely strong. Crichton surprised that any physical changes were instantly dispelled by the sheer joy of seeing his old friend once again. Well, well, big D, Crichton said, moving to hug the huge Luxon. The prey warriors instantly leapt forward, quarter blades swinging upwards threateningly. Dargo growled at them. Stand away! The warriors were fast to follow his order, though they stepped back with obvious reluctance, and more than a little continued wariness toward Crichton. Dargo reached out and pulled Crichton to him. Crichton felt the greater strength in the prosthetic arm as the Luxon hugged him. Crichton hugged back, trying to give as good as he got, although it really wasn't a fair contest. A family of refugees moved down the passageway. The prey warriors eyed them suspiciously, but the family's attention was riveted on the human and the Luxon. The eldest refugee child, a boy of around sixteen, stared openly, then turned and whispered something to his mother. "'Yes, I believe it is them,' she replied to him, her voice carrying the same awe that was evident in each of the family members' her eyes." When the family had disappeared around the bend in the passageway, Crichton and Dargo looked at each other and laughed. "'Do you ever get used to that?' Dargo asked. "'Never. You,' Crichton replied. Dargo shook his head. "'Oh, the curse of fame!' Crichton's eyes flicked to the prey warriors. "'What's with the Skellax ship and the goon squad?' "'Oh, just a little assassin problem I'm dealing with at the moment. Nobody's better at protection than Skellax, or more loyal, if the price is right.' Crichton's face betrayed his concern, and Dargo shrugged. No need to worry. It's no big deal, really. Got a dozen or so regimes that are just love to see my head dripping from one end of a jinka pole. That's all. He said it with such abject casualness, there was no mistaking this for false bravado. He'd obviously been through this many, many, many times over the years. It was just part of the life he'd chosen for himself. Crichton had actually been part of that life for several cycles. Freedom fighters was what many called them. 
They cut a swath through the uncharted territories, taking up the cause for anyone who couldn't fight for themselves. The more impossible the odds, the greater gusto with which they'd entered the fray. Which is why that refugee family reacted as they did. As a team, Crichton and Dargo had grown to be rather legendary, the two of them. Well, three of them, really. Crichton, Dargo, and Aaron. And despite his advancing cycles, Dargo had continued the fight. He was now a superior, a commander, and the troops that fought under his leadership spread to star systems in every corner of this quadrant of the galaxy. Who else is coming? Dargo asked. Uh, not sure, really, but Chana's already here. Chiana? Aboard now? Dargo said this with a small smile and more than a hint of lust. <laughs> She's with her two husbands, Dargo. Dargo looked at Crichton a moment. Then he held up two fingers with a questioning look. <laughs> Crichton nodded. Dargo considered this, and then he laughed so loud that even the stoic Skellac warriors winced from the volume. As the laugh wound down, a new thought struck Dargo, and he asked, And what of Eren? Crichton took a breath. It was a long moment before he finally told his friend. The morning after we heard of Rigel's passing, I woke up, and she was gone. Dargo frowned. No vit message? No note. She's been gone almost five solar days now. Aaron has always been impulsive, John. Don't I know it. I could tell Rigel's passing aff affected her. They'd grown very close. Well, you know, ever since Rigel's role in the birth of your our first son. Blah. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> JT. Dargo spoke the boy's name. He chuckled, remembering the events of the birth and Rigel's contribution as extremely reluctant, albeit surprisingly very effective, midwife. Oh, well done. I thought Aaron might be gone one solar day, maybe two, Crichton said. But five? Crichton was the only male with whom Dargo was ever able to discuss the subject of women. Sober, drunk, hurt, angry, horny, he and Crichton must have considered the subject through a thousand serpentine discussions, and still they had only scratched the surface, if even that. And Crichton's struggle continued to this moment, because he chose all those cycles ago to partner with the most complex female Dargo had ever known, continuing the sort of 20th century idea of women as totally unknowable, magical fairies. Un unaccessible, yes. Oh no, what... <laughs> What could possibly be going on inside their human-shaped brains? Brains. Erin yeah. has always walked her own path, John, especially when it came to emotional issues. <laughs> Dargo rested his hand on Crichton's shoulder. She'll be there waiting for you when you return home. I'm certain of it. Crichton nodded. Dargo counselling him about Erin, just like old times. And just like old times, despite Dargo's assurances, Crichton was far from certain. The trip to Hyneria took Moya three full solar days. In that time, Crichton spoke to a number of the student groups board, helped with the refugees, and spent a great deal of time catching up with Dargo and Chiana. He also met Chiana's other husband, Beaton, a huge-shouldered yag, male... Yag? Yeah, yag. Yag? Yag, male. Y-H-E-G-H. -H. Yes. Yag. Yag. Yeah. <laughs> More like yag, male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying like to... to <laughs> Like one of those Mongrolian throat singers. Yeah. Oh, sublime. With a layer of fine golden hair covering his powerfully muscled body. Oh, wow. As was the custom with Yags, he wore no clothes. Wh which was more than a little disconcerting with a male of Beaton's size. Oh, my God. He wasn't exactly the brightest penny, Craig. I'll quickly. be in my bunk. <laughs> Kay, you carry on. I have things to do. Crichton quickly considered after talking to him only a short while, but he was a kind, thoughtful fellow who loved Chan as deeply as he did Dr. Hespin. Leave it to Chana to require two males to ultimately provide her complete satisfaction. It was the middle of the night in the capital city of Rigelan. Oh, that's lovely. Oh. When Moya established orbit around the Hynerian ruling planet. Despite the hour... Rigel the 17th had a server contingent of over 100 waiting in parade formation to welcome them. After all the formalities, including the protracted greetings of court and ceremonial exchange of gifts, Pilot, of course, remembered this custom, none of the others had, <laughs> and brought the perfect offerings elaborately wrapped and ready for presentation. They were finally ferried off to their rooms at the palace. Okay, no, pump the brakes. I want an entire sub-story of just, like, this scene as they're all standing there and realizing, oh, fuck, what, what are we supposed to do? And sort of sotto voce, uh, pilot, whispering to each other, like, you got anything in your pockets? Yeah, I got some, I got some sweets. I got, <laughs> do you got anything wrapped in gold? Like, that's close enough. Got a roller. 
I I have experienced this. Okay, sidetrack. One of our one of our fantastic fantastic sidetracks. Check this out. Uh-huh. I once hung out with the mayor of Nagasaki and a bunch of like delegates from, yes. from that city because the the sister city of Nagasaki is Amstelveen, which is not where I'm from. But the Nagasaki delegation was coming over and they were bringing some school children. And as a symbolic gesture, obviously they yeah. had an equal number of school children. And they definitely wanted one of them to be a brown, part Indonesian yes. child because of the complex yes. historical relationship. <laughs> and she really wanted to go to a concert that day. Ah. And so she asked if I would fill in because I am also a brown kid. And <laughs> like, I'm not sort of close enough. <laughs> I mean, you're also part hey, Indonesian. Well, yes. Okay, yeah, so now that was the important like, part. But yeah. like, we'd we'd gone to school together, so she called me. Hey, do me a solid, so I can go to this this concert. concert okay. like- uh, so I did that. It was an amazing day. Well, absolutely fantastic. I got to meet some 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 wonderful people. Gave a speech that was in the newspaper, and then at the dinner, the school kids, three girls, came over to us and say we uh, gave us the gift of real Japanese candy, and we were like. Mm, Fuck, we did not prepare for this. So we, did, no, we were not informed that there was going to be a gift exchange. Yeah. And one of us, this big, honestly Dargo looking dude, all of 17 years old, but like spoke a little bit of Japanese because he was hugely into Kendo. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, okay, you came to talking and then the other like gave me some money that she had in her pocket and I ran off to find some candy somewhere. Vending machine? Found a vending machine. <laughs> and what did it have? hardcore Dutch salt black licorice. Oh, great. I thought, yeah, okay, that's the most Dutch that that I can find. Yeah. So I brought that to them, and they sort of said, "Mm -hmm, well, wonderful, you should should give this to other people. And so I presented a piece to the mayor of Nagasaki, (laughs) and honestly, I have never seen a man so successfully hide his disgust (laughs) as that man until I offered him a second piece. And he was like, no, 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 no. I could not possibly repay this generosity. Yes. Dutch- so that's what I'm imagining happened here. Yes, I can well imagine that. I mean, Dutch licorice is, is a bit of an acquired taste. It's like, generally speaking, yeah. underneath, you know, the line, Brussels, Hamburg, sorry, uh, Brussels, uh, Osnabrück, whatever, you know, basically. Yeah, the appreciation doesn't reach much farther south than the Rhine. No, exactly. And not the and not uh, if when the Rhine turns down towards the south. Right. Like the northern part of Germany and the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands are fine with or it. Or Salmiaki in Finland. Exactly. And the, everybody else is like, liqueur. what kind of... I believe one of the phrases that they use for it in uh, southern Germany is Beerendreck. Oh, bear scat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't possibly compare it. Uh, no, honestly. but... I mean, I've no, no, not from first-hand experience, at least. Exactly. But, you know... Oh, I once hear, heard some American podcasters, like, try, I think... That was uh, uh, Dutch black salt licorice. Right. And they described it as an entirely new emotion that no one has or wanted to feel. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you go for the double salty stuff, then yeah, it is pretty extreme. Uh, yeah, like proper, like if you start with, this, with, with the, 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 the honey ones, like the softer uh, licorice, then it's a little bit more. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's, a, that's a gateway. Candy. Yeah, it's like a stepping stone into the. Uh, What's that? Is it wormwood that it's made from? No, it's licorice root. Oh, it is just licorice root. Yeah, uh, licorice root. Because uh, licorice root sugar. twigs are also sold as candy here. It's just well, yes, you can buy them just for chew- little sticks wood, for yeah. chewing on. Yeah, it's quite delicious. Yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, after a while, you don't taste anything else, which is like it's nice for a little bit, Yay. and then it's like, yeah, that's all you taste. So this is how I imagine that that scene yeah. went for uh, for them. Okay, so they got ferried to the rooms of their palace. Crichton's accommodations were a mini palace in themselves with enough space and bedrooms to house 20 with ease. Crichton knew Rigel the Seventeenth was merely trying to graciously provide the maximum luxury, but it wasn't like a Rigel to miscalculate the needs of a guest, or his comfort level, because having all of this to himself had the opposite effect on Crichton. It made him decidedly uncomfortable. Crichton was glad to be here, for Rigel's sake, but he longed to be home again in his simple valley abode. Plus, he wouldn't know until he arrived home, whether Aaron was there waiting for him. He lifted a piece of liba fruit, perfectly ripe, of course, from a gilded bowl and bounced it in his hand as he considered his palatial surroundings. Quite a fantastic difference from his first visit to the planet, he thought. His first contact with Hyneria was also at night, but it involved a surreptitious glide landing, no engines, no lights, Whoa. into a temper swamp a good 50 metres from the capital city itself. He had come with Rigel, his Rigel, 
to assist in retaking the Hynerian throne from Rigel's current cousin Bishan. We will speak of him so, no more! <laughs> the, temper, the Temper Swamp was the most hospitable aspect of the first half-cycle of that venture. Wow. But they ultimately prevailed. Bishan was deposed, and Crichton and the others were able to leave, with Rigel once again ruler of the vast Hynerian Empire, a far wiser, kinder, and more generous Dominar than which he had ruled the first time around. Oh wow! Mm. Yeah, he's been he's been forged on the anvil of well, first of all the Zelbinian and then Moya. So long ago, Crichton thought to himself. So long. Hello, John. Oh God! Crichton recognized the voice immediately, deep in tone, As do I. measured in cadence. Although it came from behind him, Crichton didn't turn immediately. That was because he had heard that voice origin in his own mind for so many cycles. Yikes! But it had been gone from his mind for nearly two centuries now. He turned. Scorpius stood just inside the doorway, head cocked to one side, an almost imperceptible smile on thin lips. Crichton took a deep breath. Well, well, you're up late, Scorpi. Always. Scorpius first came to Hyneria at the same time as Crichton and the others, back on the temper swamp trip. Once Rigel regained his throne, the diminutive Dominar asked the Sebastian Scarron half-breed to stay on as his warger, counsellor. For some reason, the image of Rasputin always popped into Crichton's <gasps> mind when he thought about this arrangement. That's amazing! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing! Not enough hair for Rasputin, though, but yeah. He's into freaky sex like Rasputin. I was going to say, he probably, probably fucks was. like Rasputin. <laughs> yeah, there anyway. you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now I'm imagining Rasputin, like, popping a cool rod out <laughs> of the side of his head when he comes. And Scorpius standing before him, now in a set of quite elaborate black robes with ceremonial sashes of red and yellow, only supported this image. Crichton. Yes, 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 it would. Sorry? Yes, it would support that image that you just painted in the oh. mind there. <laughs> Crichton long ago made his peace with Scorpius, born, he supposed, from the fact that with the Scarens no longer a threat, ooh, Scorpius had, here on Hyneria, finally found for himself a new place of purpose and of acceptance. Scorpius stayed that night until dawn. He and Crichton sat on the balcony, enjoying the temperate Hynerian night breathing in the sweet scent of light-blooming Tainan, and talking on many new subjects. Oh. Scorpius explained in greater detail how Rigel came to choose this time to pass. His health was failing. He was beginning to make poor decisions on behalf of his people, a turn of events he simply would not allow to continue. So he transferred power to his chosen heir, a bright young female, the first ever female dominar, and proceeded to die in his chosen manner. Good for him. Sorry, that was me. And how was that? Crichton asked. By overeating, of course. Oh, yikes. <laughs> it took Crichton a moment to absorb this. Then he shook his head and smiled. Rigel ate to death? In all, he needed a few twenty solar days to complete the task. Yikes! Scorpius said. But he relished every moment of it. Crichton looked to the horizon, saw the first purple hues of the Hynerian sun beginning to show themselves. I wish I'd had a chance to visit with him. Speak with him before... You'll see him again, John. Speak with him as often as you wish. You know that. And Crichton looked over at Scorpius. Edit, edit, edit. Scorpius. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I said I was going to edit it, but now you've got to be... Okay, fine, I'm not editing it. And Crichton looked over at Scorpius with that same knowing look that he shared with Chiana and Pilot back aboard Moya. After Scorpius left, Crichton went to the nearest bedroom. Probably not the largest, but Crichton didn't care. In fact, he preferred that it not be the largest, and lay down on the bed. Despite that he had not slept in nearly twenty arms, he found it impossible to drift off, and he knew the reason. After a couple of arms to tossing and turning, he gave up, and rose to bathe and dress in anticipation of the Feast of Tribute, scheduled for midday. When Crichton arrived at the Royal Dining Hall, Dargo, Chiana, and Pilot were already seated at the serpentine table reserved for honoured guests. Every delicacy imaginable both Hynerian and off-world, was represented, and more were being rushed to service from the multiple kitchens. Not long after Crichton found his place beside Pilot, Scorpius arrived, escorting Her Royal Highness, Dominar Rigel the Seventeenth. I'm now imagining some sort of massive, like, dim sum buffet <gasps> hall type thing, you oh. know, with plates of food, right? And the halls of little, Valhalla. These little, push, these, these little old ladies pushing carts with steaming trays of, like... Automated for, throne sled uh, that just deliver it on its own. Oh, no, come on. That's not the... the it wouldn't be the Hynerian no, way. No, it's true. Anyway, 
Crichton fought the new Rigel. Sorry. Crichton found the new Rigel every bit as bright and charming as Scorpius described. Mm. Crichton asked after some of the others whom he thought might be coming to honour Rigel. Stark, he knew, crossed over many cycles ago, and Jewel, dear Jewel, was too infirm to make the trip, but sent a very touching vid message. Aww. Of the many others who had come and gone aboard Moya over the many cycles, Kalash, Imam, Sikozu, Naranti, Lehima, Narati, Natar... No, sorry, Natira. Natira? Natira. Natira. Oh, my God, she's the... A- She's the spider woman from the uh, shadow yeah. depository. I suppose, yeah. All had fallen out of contact with Moya long ago. Crichton didn't really expect him to be here, but he inquired after them just the same. The memorial service I wasn't... Mean, it makes sense, considering the relationship that Scorpius had with her. Uh-huh. Although, yeah, it might have taken them a little bit well from the, after the falling out that they... Kind of, well, they didn't really have a falling out at that point. Both of them got kind of punked by the crew at that point. Yeah, and... and- they sort of screw each other as well. She was going to um, eat Crichton's eyes. Then that's not Scorpius' problem. No, that's that's true. No, but I mean, she spent time on Moya, didn't right? She, according to this, yeah, fair enough. But yeah, I mean, if if Scorpius spent time there after you know season oh, four, then that kind of makes sense. Oh, okay, so the memorial service wasn't to begin until near the end of the day. So after the luncheon, Crichton went for a long walk through the streets of the city. Effigies of Rigel were everywhere. Statues, banners, Rigel-shaped balloons carried by the Hynerian young. Crichton stopped in at the Rigel the Sixteenth Hall of History, an enormous edifice that, until recently, had obviously been some other sort of museum and arts plaza. Crichton strolled from room to room, wing to wing, viewing what seemed like every microt of Rigel's life celebrated, if not in vid-image recreation, than in the reading of epic poems or live stage presentations. Even puppetry was represented. <laughs> <laughs> when Crichton walked in on Rigel, The Prison Years, a stage production where Rigel was portrayed by a heavily muscled young Hynerian who played the exiled Dominar as a latter-day Spartacus, selflessly leading his fellow prisoners to freedom, Crichton had seen enough. Uh, I'm now thinking of, like, Dominar blood and sand, or blood and mud in this case. <laughs> oh, <laughs> mud and sand, mud and, what was it? Oh, yeah, but blood and sand blood and in the mud. original. Yes, so blood and mud. Yeah, I mean, he sick. doesn't like mud. He hates mud. He knows mud. As he stepped back onto the street, he shielded his eyes and looked skyward. Ships of all shapes and sizes crisscrossed the violet sky, some on their way off planet, others just arriving. He knew it was ridiculous to think that among the arriving ships he would be able to pick out one in particular, or that the ship he was looking for was even within several million metros of here. Crichton drew his gaze from the sky and started across the busy boulevard, heading back to the palace. Suddenly a voice called, Mr. Crichton! John Crichton! Crichton saw the young man hurrying his way through the throng on the pedestrian way. He was an off-worlder, close to Crichton's size, although weighing probably 400 pounds. Hmm. One look and Crichton instantly knew what the young man wanted. The anxious look in his eyes and the vit recorder hanging around his neck gave him away. Sorry, I don't speak to Jernavoyance, Crichton said as he continued down the street. The young man hurried after him, using his girth to cut a swath and keep pace with Crichton. Please, Mr. Crichton, uh, Commander Crichton, I'm just not any John Avoyant. I'm Daska Oscar. Maybe you've heard of me? Mm, sorry. Crichton tried to cut across the boulevard, but the traffic was too thick at the moment. My powers extend to 60 star systems, Commander. My thought stories are reach a mental subscriber base of over 100 million. Crichton knew what was coming next. You've had so many incredible adventures. I've had to admit so great many stories to tell, but there's one you've never spoken of. The young man drew in an excited breath. You've, you've taken the journey, haven't you, Commander? That's what the legend says, that you made the passage and returned to tell about it, only you won't tell. Crichton stared forward among the geese that I don't know whether you can hear, but if you if you can, that's foley that we added. Yes, there's just some Hynerian geese Hynerian flying geese, over. yeah. They will be served for dinch. Yeah. <laughs> For dinch? Uh, like, no, because, this is awesome. Because I mean, like the Hynerian clock has yes. like... I mean, you've got like brunch, so why shouldn't he have dinch? I agree. <laughs> Crichton stared forward. He'd been queried about this a thousand times, probably more, by everyone from multi-system monarchs to rummy-eyed bargargs who could barely get the question out. They'd all heard the story, the legend, and they all wanted to know if it was true. Wanted to know the one unknown among all sentient beings. Come on, Commander, all of the exploits you have for, uh, for your fellow voyagers on Moya are rightfully famous for. This is renowned as your greatest adventure. They say that when you saw there is a great reason Domino Rigel wasn't afraid to die. Y- you've really mastered the fast-talking there. 
Like you almost sound like one of those. Like, have you ever heard those speed debaters? Oh no, unfortunately not. Sorry, no, as in like... people who debate quickly. Right. Right. No jokes there. Okay. But like, they're they're tasked with like holding a cogent argument to a given question, yeah. but then they only have like thirty seconds to right. uh, to make it, yeah, yeah. and so they speak very quickly. <clears throat> they also speak while they're inhaling, so, so <laughs> yeah. they then have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Second <laughs> wow. Anyway. It, it sounds strange, but it's an incredible mental exercise. Anyway, anyway, yes, yes, yes. The journal voyant leaned closer, his breath smelling of haba cabbage and yeston ale. The legend is that at one point you and the others crossed the horizon into death itself and returned. Others claim that you do it spiritually, but you travel there physically. Death isn't a state, is it, Commander? It's, it's a place. Over time, Crichton had developed a hundred retorts to the question. Some witty, some thoughtful, some dismissive. Well, all of them dismissive, ultimately, because the one thing he and the others all agreed after the invent in question, they would never tell. What happened during that journey was indeed their greatest adventure, and what they discovered wasn't meant to be known until each individual took his or her personal voyage upon succession of their physical life. Why would you share, Commander? Why? Crichton knew why, but to answer would open a floodgate that was meant to remain closed. I'm sorry, young man, my advice to your subscribers and to you, live your life here and now to its fullest. The but, rest of it you'll discover soon enough. Please but, let me finish. Sorry, I was, when like my, one, I was one sentence ahead of you. I know, you're, I know, I know, you were, you were clairvoyant as well as journavoyant, but yeah. I, do, I do have scripted dialogue and yeah. I'm a professional. <laughs> I'm clearly not. <laughs> but Crichton wasn't going to say any more. Actually, he'd said more than he usually did. He saw an opening and stepped into the boulevard. The young journavoyant looked at the fast-moving traffic and didn't dare follow, not with his girth. Now, that's what Crichton was counting on. More than half a million Hynerians packed the seemingly dimensionless Grand Rigelan Cathedral. Five times that number crowded the streets surrounding the spired structure. Crichton was escorted to his place of honour in the frontmost pew. Dargo and Pilot were at one, to one side of him, Chiana and her husbands to the other. On the altar rested a jewel-encrusted sarcophagus, the likes of which Crichton had never seen. Don't cry for me, Hyneria. <laughs> Crichton sang softly to himself as he looked around at the spectacle of it all. <laughs> the truth is I never loved you. <laughs> 600 billion. Okay. The 200 piece Royal Hynerian Orchestra began to play softly. What instruments do we think Hynerians play? And also, does the woodwind section put their flutes in their ears? Well, I mean, okay. I mean, it's going to be ban it's swamp cultures. So it's going to be banjos. Uh <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. And jugs and washboard and. Imagine a banjo orchestra. Imagine the sound of 200 banjos. Oh. It would be loud. Well, yeah, but it would also be just... It would be, it would be yeah. beautiful and, and hypnotic. Uh, anyway, the din of the, ho the half million filling the cathedral started to subside. The ceremonies were commencing. Crichton glanced over, noting that the seat between Chiana and himself was still vacant. Interesting, considering that the place was jammed to capacity. A quick look behind him revealed almost an entire pew roped off and unoccupied. Crichton turned back in his seat, eyes settling onto the altar. Her Highness Rigel the Seventeenth had now assumed her place on the throne. Her royal court, including Vorgan, uh, Councillor Scorpius, were all in attendance, fanning out on either side of her. It was then that Crichton noticed. Rigel the Seventeenth was staring directly at him. And even more odd, there was a trace of a smile on her lips. Crichton frowned in curiosity. Why was she staring at him? And what was she smiling about? A moment, and then her gaze moved from him to the rear of the cathedral. Crichton shifted in his seat and looked for himself. The light through the multi-story cathedral door shone brightly, so at first it was difficult for Crichton to see exactly what had captured Her Highness' attention. Then he saw a cluster of late arrivals being escorted down the centre aisle. It's kind of like that walking in from the light from we we had at that scene when uh, Zahn was in the prison, you know, the, the, the shot that's like oh, always been in the yeah. opening scene. of. Uh, they're, they're walking in silhouettes, yeah, and, it's, and it's Aaron and Dargo and yeah. John, and they're so studly. Yes! It looked like perhaps 10 or 12 of them in, uh, uh, in all, mostly adults, but some children as well. Crichton couldn't make out any faces. There were no more than silhouettes against the brightness of the doorway behind him. See? Okay, so I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at anything in the story. I'm laughing because of this sentence structure reminded me of my favorite line from the Wes Anderson film uh, Moonrise Kingdom, where a worried mother whose son has done R U N N O F T has been going through his things and hoping that it will help the uh, the manhunt for her uh, for her eloped son says that she found his paintings he's done a lot of watercolors yeah. and she says Francis McDormand says in 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 in, in perfect deadpan mostly landscapes but some nudes <laughs> <laughs> very nice <laughs> But there was one silhouette, a female form at the lead of the group, that Crichton recognized immediately. The group was shown to the pew where Crichton sat. Is this seat taken? Crichton rose quickly, almost toppling in his shock. And the radiant Aronson yeah! leaned forward and kissed him softly. <laughs> I-, I thought you... you... Crichton stammered. I didn't believe it, should you... I didn't believe it should just be you and me here, Erden whispered, raising her hand to motion over the others, being ushered into the vacant pew behind him. His and Aaron's first son, J.T., looked over at Crichton and smiled. J.T.'s beautiful wife and their three children, Crichton's first grandchildren, were beside him. Crichton and Aaron's other two children, middle son Eric and youngest daughter Kella, eased into the pew with their families as well. Dargo, Pilot and Chana were all grinning broadly. Aaron quickly leaned over and kissed and hugged them. Crichton glanced at the altar where Rigel the Seventeenth was watching them, smiling warmly. She'd obviously known all along what Aaron was planning. Crichton turned back to Aaron. Why, why this big secret? he asked. Aaron didn't answer. Instead, her gaze fell onto the last family member gliding into her place at the end of the pew, a striking woman in flow- flowing finery. Oh, wow. I was yeah, just thinking... Be- it's going to be the daughter, isn't it, from Look at the Princess? Oh, my God. <laughs> Crichton had only met her once before, many cycles ago, but recognition came instantly to him. Katrana, he said in hushed tones. Oh, this is your bit, but I'm so excited. Do it, do it. Oh, go on. Katrana, Katrana, he said in hushed tones. She was his daughter, his first child, although she was chronologically younger than the son, JT. Huh. She was his daughter by Princess Katrala, sired all those cycles ago in the breakaway colonies. Oh, wow. Aaron saw the tears at the corners of Crichton's eyes. It was such a long journey to collect everyone. I knew you would protest and offer a million reasons not to do it. So, no discussion. I just did it. Their cheeks brushed as she put her lips close to his ear. I thought, she added softly, that all our children should be with us for Rigel. Oh. Crichton looked into Aaron's eyes. The cathedral lights were dimmed now. The orchestra's overture had written to a fanfare, and now that I'm imagining them all as banjos, that's <laughs> quite a quite a mental uh, orchestra. Aaron gripped Crichton's hand, and together they took their seats. I'm kind of like thinking, for some reason, I'm, my mind keeps going to one of those uh, Indonesia uh, anklung orchestras. You know, those those uh, bamboo... Anklung. It's those, those, those bamboo rattle things that only produce one tone, so you have, in order to play a tune, you like, need 20 or 30 people each. Oh, my like, God. To, you know, those... I really can't describe them. They're basically... They're kind it's of like, like a one-note rattles. marimba is the sound. Yeah, yes. Right? Just but but, one but marimba you, you do by very rapidly shaking them. So it's, it's always yeah, trilling yeah, yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah. So something like that I can also imagine. I mean, you, oh, need, wow. you need, need 200 of those to have a decent orchestra, especially yeah. one worth a domino. <laughs> the ceremony lasted four and a half hours, shorter really than any of them expected. But in the end, it was grand and fitting celebration. And throughout it all, the hands of John Crichton and Aaron's son never parted. No. That evening, Crichton and his extended family returned to his rooms. Now Rigel the Seventeenth choice of such large quarters for him made perfect sense. The expansive suite accommodated all the Crichtons magnificently. It was a warm, wonderful family reunion. Not only having Crichton's entire family together with him, but his other family as well. Dargo, Chana, Pilot, Scorpius. Hmm. And that night, Crichton retired to the same bed he occupied the night before. But this time he slept soundly, because this night he had Aaron at his side again. The journey home aboard Moya was a welcome uh, respite after the emotional roller coaster of Rigel's services and the whirlwind reunion with kids and grandkids. When the last farewell was said, the last hug given, Crichton rode the transport pod back into his valley. It would take Aaron no more than a few solid days to return the children to their respective lives. Then she would be back here, back home as well. In his kitchen, Crichton reached into the preservation chamber and pulled himself out a cold bottle of Philip nectar. He took it out onto the porch, where two chairs rested side by side. 
Crichton eased into the chair that was his, cracked open the fellop, and took a sip. Across the valley the two suns were setting. Three quarters of the larger sun already dipped behind the horizon, the smaller sun not far behind. In a very short while the day would be over. Crichton looked out across the valley. He thought about Rigel. Then other faces drifted across his consciousness. Dear departed Zahn, and oh. Grace, oh. and Stark. Oh. Mm, well. His own father and mother, his oh. grandparents, and everyone he'd known on earth were surely long since departed from this existence. Well, a few people did inject, get injected with translator microbes. Mm. And if they have this effect... Yeah. Good point, yes. Probably Jack would have, right? If they'd mm. offered it to, like, senators. Yeah, makes sense. He knew only the barest tip of what was to come. He had been there, after all. But, wow. Well, okay, so we're just accepting that he had just gone to death, whatever that is, to the afterworld. Who? John. Yeah. yeah, and Apparently the rest of the it was crew. some sort of adventure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. No, that's fi- we're all fine with that? Okay, well, yeah, yeah. We'll I mean, move on. Rockney S. O'Bannon says it is so. <laughs> it's canon. It's O'Bannon canon. But of one thing he was certain, he would be seeing them all again, and there were countless adventures still to come. The larger sun was completely gone now, its smaller brother just brushing the horizon. The valley before him was taking on an unearthly crimson hue. Unearthly? There was a word he hadn't thought of in a very, very long time. Before long, the smaller sun had disappeared too. As its light faded, the moons of his planet became visible. Three of them, standing out in milky relief against the rich black canopy of space and the splash of millions of stars. As he stared out at the vista, something his father told him long ago came to his mind. Be your own kind of hero, John. Hero? Crichton would always be uneasy applying that term to himself, but he had helped a lot of beings in his long life out there. In a way, large or small, he'd made a difference. He hoped it was a life that made his father proud. Ah, Crichton took another sip of his fellip. His mind, at last, wandered back to those early times aboard Moya, when all he wanted, with the greatest desperation, was get back to Earth, to get home. Sitting here tonight on this porch, looking out at the stars, waiting for Aaron to return, he knew that he had accomplished that very thing. John Crichton was home. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's oh. amazing! Rockney S. O'Bannon, who has just celebrated <gasps> his own 311th birthday, stands very proud of his sem- uh, term- seminal work back in the late 20th and early 21st centuries in something called television. Yeah. Among the series he started for this television were Alien Nation, Sequest DSV, and Farscape. What a legacy. <laughs> you know, yes, if, it is. If we hadn't had the, the eventual miniseries that you didn't know about, and that is, at this time, nobody contemplated. No, very good. Uh, this would have been the last of it. And actually, speaking of, this was the last Farscape story that we've read for you. Yes. Yes, because as we've concluded the series, we've also concluded these, uh, these fanfics. We do have two more episodes and um, an in, in between to go because as always we do like main episode every other week yes so next time we will do part one of the mini series that you don't know about yes. the title which you'll you'll find out soon and then for the um for the sort of hiatus between those two we've got we've got a little something planned yes we think you'll enjoy it i hope so too thank you for joining us see us next week for a regular episode of uh, so far escape meanwhile i'm kaki i'm k bye bye so bye so bye we nailed it! Yeah. Can you believe it? It only took us 400 million tries. Wow, I'm so proud of us. Yes. <laughs>